welcome into another episode of the Young Turfs Podcast. This is your host, Mason Viner, joined again by Ahmed Gafir. Ahmed, it's football season, week zero is here, but not quite yet time for our Terps. We got a defense preview coming on the show today. Yeah, I think uh, obviously, like you said, week zero, get a chance to um, watch a little bit of football, uh, get a chance to enjoy it a little bit while Maryland, obviously, they won't have a scrimmage this weekend but you know uh, like we've kind of talked about through fall camp a lot to like on this defensive side of the ball so uh, we're gonna take a take a look at uh, what to know who to know uh, and where maybe the areas of concern yeah and let's jump right into it I think there's one question that has to be on the top of every Terps fan's mind and that's can this team finally find themselves a I guess Yannick Ngakwe type player out there somebody that can come off the edge and actually provide some pressure yeah, I think that's going to be the the biggest question kind of for this defense right now. And I think, obviously, Donnell Brown, I mean, when you look at uh, when Maryland was able to get him, a former uh, – did really well last year at St. Francis, was All-American before uh, – I think he hit the portal maybe two, three days later. He announced his commitment to Maryland, so it was pretty pretty quick. So uh, he joined the team full-time this summer for workouts. So he seems to be kind of that option A uh, where he's able to kind of lean on that speed with his size to maybe bend out tight a little bit, work on his technique and, and pass rush moves a little bit more to maybe do so consistently. Um, you know, Calvin Wyatt's another guy where he's – another backer where I think he can play play uh, and, and kind of factor into that rotation as well. Uh, but then, you know, you look at defensive end as well, you know, will Maryland be able to kind of generate some of that uh, along the line? And I think Quayshawn Fuller is probably that guy where, you know, we've we've heard some of the praise through the offseason. I've been mentioning it a couple of times on Inside the Black and Gold, and it seems like he's kind of that guy where he has some of that pass rush uh, ability as well. So, uh, but yeah, obviously being able to put pressure on the quarterback and uh, doing so consistently has been uh, the Achilles heel for Maryland and really set uh, you know, Yannick Ngakwe, I mean, they had Jesse Annabonum and uh, Byron Cowart for a little bit um, where they were able to, you know, generate some pressure on the outside, but um, just consistently doing so has been has been a, a problem for Maryland. So uh, it does seem like Danelle Brown will kind of be that uh, that first option in order to fill that hole. Yeah, for me, when I look at it, it's all it's all from a scheme perspective. You know, B. Will's now in his second year being the guy in the room for Maryland from a defensive perspective. I think when you look across the board right now, there's some things that jump off, and and that is, one, how just athletic this defense is from top to bottom, how many guys they have that can potentially give them some outside ideas, some creative ideas in the blitz game. You look at a guy uh, starting from, you know, the back end of your defense, Dante Trader and Bo Braid, you know, you can send them on blitzes and create pressure. I think you mentioned it on the site. They have a lot of opportunities from that nickel or SAF position, whoever's out there on the field, whether that's Vontae Williams or Glenn Miller gets healthy again, a guy who I really liked when they brought him off the edge to create those situations. And you kind of saw as the season went on, they got more aggressive in in different ways last year. And I think they're going to have to continue to do that. As far as front four pressure goes, you really have to get some push up the middle. That's one spot where I think Kite and Finau were not great. They were not really good pass rushers in there. They didn't really get much push up the middle. And then while you bring in talent on the edge, you don't really have proven guys coming back. I think really it's going to be like bringing Barham. It's going to be bringing Dante Trader off the edge. It's going to be maybe mixing in some corner blitzes and then calling them at the right times, which is, I think, one of the spots where Maryland, I think, they've struggled. They they have pressure when in situations where a team's got a perfect counter to it, slants across the middle. They really do tip their hand hard on that. I think it's going to be a lot of honing in on the craft of disguising the blitz off the edge and, and finding different ways to more or less overload blitz a team. Yeah. And I think you, you said, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the scheme packages and whatnot. I mean, we've seen Tarheep still uh, really the last two years uh, where he's lined up in the slot and he's been able to kind of generate some pressure. Glenn Miller's another guy where, you know, we found him inside the box and I think he's probably, um, yeah, I think he's in contention for one of the most physical guys. I think Avante Williams, uh, uh, Bo Braid. Uh, those are two, obviously, others that come to mind. But I think Glenn Miller, like you said, you know, when he gets healthy uh, next couple of weeks, I think he'll he'll kind of be able to be a factor in there. Um, and I just think that the kind of the versatility with the nickel position and just really the the ability in the secondary for a lot of these guys where, you know, Jaquan Shepard, Tarheep still um, uh, bringing back second year when Gavin Gibson, once he's back on the field, but, you know, Lionel, Lionel Whitaker, uh, Corey Coley, you know, there's a lot of, lot of you know 
interchangeable parts, guys that have gotten some experience or may, been able to make strides over the off season where Maryland can, like you said, get creative a little bit. So uh, I, I think that there's, there's a lot to like in, you know, kind of the secondary and obviously that inside linebacker room. Uh, I think Jason Barham, you know, he's kind of be a force. Uh, I think he, fans were able to kind of see just how impactful he can be and, and kind of testament to him for, for starting uh, every game that he was available, uh, beating out uh, two veterans uh, for that spot. So um, I think he's going to be a, a key piece. And, you know, I think he'll be able to, you know, flash on the outside a little bit as well, but uh, just kind of being that versatile backer uh, for Maryland's defense. And uh, hopefully, you know, he ends up being Maryland's leading tackler this year. Yeah, and then it, it kind of segues us into one of our other points, which is depth along this line. But the, the thing that also jumps out to you when you look at it is, especially at that Jack linebacker spot, if it's not Brown there, then then kind of who is it behind that? Are we going to have to see a guy like Neo Avery come in, true freshman, right there on, on the edge of your defensive line? That's that's a scary thing, even if you can come in and play. You know, these Big Ten seasons, we've had freshmen flash early. They get beat up. They get worn down. They're, you know, playing against fifth-year, fourth-year guys every week in, week out, and they just get beat up over time. Do you see a guy like, you know, Daniel Owens step in there. We've had a couple of these players that Maryland's pulled locally from the first Loxley class that are in year three, four, even year two guys with the program. Yep. Who can you kind of expect to step in and maybe maybe take some of those reps? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I think Daniel Owens. I think he'd be more of like a defensive end. I think he'd kind of be behind like a Quayshon Fuller right now. Um, he's done. I mean, if you notice just what his body development from last year to this year has added uh, incredible mass, um, and you can just see it in his upper body frame, just the way he's filled out. Um, but uh, another guy uh, on the outside. Um, I think obviously, like you mentioned, you know, Donnell Brown, uh, Riyad Wilmot, I think we've kind of seen a little bit of him, you know, the last couple of years, a uh, rotational piece in the bowl game last year. So um, I think he could be a guy where we kind of see him a little bit situationally and just to, to kind of iron out the depth. But uh, obviously, like you said, you know, there's not a lot of proven uh, experience on the outside and then uh, along the defensive line. You know, I think there's some some pieces there. Um like you said, just got a lot of it unproven guys that are either kind of stepping up into new roles or newcomers that are kind of stepping into bigger roles from their previous spots. But uh, I just I think that there's a lot more optimism and just kind of the overall bodies and, and the, the depth uh, and the way that the, the, these guys kind of fit into the defense that uh, kind of give confidence in the front seven. Yeah. And you see inside, I actually have a little bit more confidence just when you look down the list, maybe guys that don't jump off the page, but have played meaningful snaps for you. And for those of you that have listened to this show and, and have seen anything that I put out there, I, I really do talk about players that have played Big Ten snaps and knowing what you to expect out of them. And then a guy like an Isaac Bunyan, who, look, not the highest rated recruit ever. I'm not going to say he's going to be your number one defensive lineman on the inside, but go two years back, three years back, you turn on the film, Maryland, Minnesota, he's out there playing you know, snaps when that game was close, when Minnesota was really good, which I guess was two years ago. He was out there last year. Christian Teague, another one, the guy who came in, was it from yeah. Morgan State that he was a transfer from last year? Um, he's out there, you know, SMU, Maryland. He's playing right in the middle of the game when that game's close and got snaps throughout the year. So at least you have in that spot, unlike the other side of the ball, you have a lot of guys who have played in these games that have been in there. And whether those snap counts were under 10, they were still, you know, rotationally in there. You know, Teague playing a lot of nose tackle for Maryland last year when – Fina and Kite were down, and then those guys, you can play a really good rotation through there. Now, still those guys up front that are starting, like a Jordan Phillips, is very, very unproven. Yeah, uh, and I think that's right. I think Jordan Phillips, I think – um, just going off him, I think he's a guy, I mean, I've written about it a couple of times, but they really wanted him out of high school. Um, and I think a lot of the traits they liked out of high school were kind of the same traits that they wanted uh, when he was in the portal, uh, which is why he's kind of been able to uh, step in or has the, had the ability to step into a potential starting role, which, you know, I very much expect him to. But yeah, like you mentioned, you know, Christian Teague, Isaac Bunyan, but those guys, I asked Mike Loxley on Big Ten Media or uh, uh, Maryland Media Day, uh, just about that overall defensive line depth, you know, just with a lot of guys that you know they've shown flashes or they've proven it at lower levels elsewhere um and now you know they're kind of coming in or you know they were uh you know tommy king basote ty, ty Zay johnson both those guys who were rotational guys that they're going to be asked to be uh, stepped up as every down defensive lineman for this for this roster and you know isaac bunny and christian teak both of those guys were among the first guys mentioned uh dylan fontes is another guy you know when you look at guys who primarily play early uh in their true freshman season 
Uh, nine times out of ten, it's guys who get there in January. And Dylan Bond just was a guy that they really liked uh, out of high school. Um, we're able to get him thanks to Baker, uh, Brian Williams. Um, and he comes in, and I, I expect him to, to kind of be in that rotation as well. Uh, how much he plays, especially just being in his first year, I think it's kind of remains to be seen. But uh, definitely a possibility that he's able to play through that. But then, you know, you look at Drake Goldberg, another guy who's kind of able to. Um, and I mentioned this when he committed, but I don't think he'd be a guy that started. But has able has been able to prove that you know he's a quality piece uh a plug and play guy inside uh where he was able to do that at angelo state this year and now he's able to come in um be a rotational piece uh behind tommy ken or excuse me uh jordan phillips inside so um, i just think i think that there's a lot of these guys that you know that, that in the role that they're in uh like we saw henry chibuzzi a year ago where you know he kind of made that jump up uh and you know kind of fit in, in a rotational piece and you know he loomed large uh just kind of through the conference play and just kind of being able to especially those short yardage situations trey colbert is another guy who fits right into that mold so uh, i think that there's 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 reason why that there's a lot to like even with these guys like you know tommy king basote ty Zay johnson but those guys like i mentioned um stepping into bigger roles you know tommy basote you know now is going to be about the consistency the conditioning ty Zay johnson has been really good and just a, a natural leader uh in himself so uh can he kind of be able to put the consistency uh on the field as well i think you know but those guys will have every chance to prove that they can uh as maryland looks to make more of a push in the trenches yeah, I'm mean, going to kind of echo what you said. It's just time for some of these guys to step up. You know, you look at where when they brought in Tommy A and when they brought in Johnson, they were these huge recruits from Maryland. They got big guys out of here that could play in the defensive lineman that were from the DMV, and it was kind of like Loxley's impact, immediate impact on Maryland. Now, as a freshman, true freshman for those guys, I don't really think that it was – a, a realistic expectation to see them on the field. Now we've constantly seen them kind of in flashes and rotation. They had two, what I'm going to say is really legit big 10 defensive linemen and Ami Finau and Nasili Kite in front of them. Now it's time for them year. Is it three or four for those? Uh, it'd be year three. They were 2021 recruits. Yeah. Year three for them. That's when, that's when those guys need to start to produce for you up front on the line. And just like yeah. what I said last week, when we talked about the offensive line and seeing guys like Chris Love be, you know, on the three deep when that's a guy you brought in a couple of years back, those are the pieces you need to develop up front to win games. That's what you need yeah. to see. And they lost a lot of that class that they brought in the defensive line, but what's left of it needs to produce now. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, I think Loxley, he's really echoed that statement a lot on the offensive side of the ball. You know, it takes, you know, two or three years to kind of build up the, the trenches a little bit. And, you know, that same same holds true on the defense side of the ball, especially uh, for Maryland, you know, with Loxley when he came in to just kind of bolster up that roster. And I think Tommy Akimbusote, you know, he was a guy who was four star out of Flowers, had a long list of offers. You know, Oklahoma, I remember, was a school that was in the mix uh, for him at the end. But, um, you know, he was a guy, you know, at 6'4", uh, was really light on his feet. The way he moved uh, was the, just that uh, natural athleticism with his size, I think, was kind of what really jumped out. And now it was kind of, you know, just, you know, learning the, the technique and, and making that transition. So I think it's, you know, natural that we've kind of seen him, uh, you know, step gradually make those strides. And like you said, now is the time where, where it's time for them to produce in order for Maryland's defense to uh, live up to expectations. Yeah, let's move on. Let's uh, we'll circle back to linebackers since they play a role in in that front seven for us. Let's talk about the defensive backfield, a spot that I think really is finally a true strength for Maryland. I mean, last year you had two big time guys that jumped off the page, but now you start to see another spot where recruiting looks like it's paying off for the Terps. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, Maryland's able to uh, bring back Bo Brady, Dante Trader, but those guys are just natural leaders, uh, very good friends. And I think that that, that chemistry between them uh, really puts the safety room in good hands. Obviously, to Marcus Cooley, he's another guy who got in there, uh, former three star from North Carolina. He got he enrolled in January. Um, he's, he's looked good. Um, former Miami safety, Avante Williams. Uh, we mentioned him for, for that nickel spot as well. I think he's a guy that is versatile, um, and, and I think he's going to be a big piece. And Glenn Miller, you know, like we talked about, I think when he's healthy, I think he's going to be another key piece. He honestly might be my most uh, underrated player on this Maryland defense. I think when he plays, you know, he, he's never – been uh, viewed as maybe a clear-cut starter, but I think that when he plays and he's on the field, nine times out of ten, you, you notice when he's on the field. 
Um, so I think that he's he's a really good piece. And then obviously the cornerback room, you know, Jaquan Shepard, you know, he's going to be able to go against those wide receiver ones. Uh, he's still, you know, he's going to be able, Oxy talked about him playing outside along with playing in the nickel uh, and in, uh, in an effort to kind of maybe uh, accelerate the development process of, you know, obviously, you know, you have Corey Coley, who's a veteran now, but, you know, Lionel Whitaker, uh, Gavin Gibson, when he gets back and Perry Fisher, um, Perry Fisher is a guy that, Initially signed as a wide receiver, played quarterback in high school, also played corner in high school, but just that natural athleticism, the way he moves um, when, he, when he arrived last June, uh, very quickly made the move to the defensive side of the ball. Um, and just like like I said, I think with the, the his ability to play cor- or quarterback and uh, maybe analyze the, the other side of the ball a little bit, I think that kind of helped accelerate um, just his his uh, development process as a corner and as Henry Baker. You know, he's very much into detail. So just learning the technique of it, that's kind of been the biggest strides for him over this last year. So I think Perry Fisher is a guy that he's able to step into that rotational role. But like I said, I think, uh, you know, mentioned a lot of names for, for a good reason. I think that that's why the secondary is in such good hands this year. Yeah, the ones that that I think fly under the radar for many people that don't follow Maryland recruiting as closely or as involved as you and I is Perry Fisher. I mean, this is a guy the staff was really, really high on coming out of high school, played it, kind of had to play quarterback in that last year of high school. But a guy who I was actually disappointed to not see stay in the wide receiver room and be moved to the defensive side of the ball. I think he's a guy that's going to be able to make an impact. It might not be this year. It might be in a really small role this year. But I think over time, you know, this is a spot where, you know, a guy like Tariq still is probably going to move on at the end of this year. Same thing for Shepard. Guys who are coming in trying to make that last push for the league. I think you start to see the young guys come in. This staff has been laser focused on getting really, really fast in the defensive backfield, being really, really versatile and athletic in it. And the fact that I think you see two or even sometimes three safeties right now in the conversation to move and play in that nickelback role in, in some way just shows – the job that they've done to get the right players on the team and to be able to kind of shift and tweak what they're doing week in, week out. A guy like, you know, we, I feel like we keep throwing his name out, but a guy like Glenn Miller or Vontae Williams who can step in, play that nickelback role against teams that are going to love to run the ball and use their tight ends a lot, which everybody knows you're going to see in this conference, especially when they play Illinois midseason. You can bring one of those guys up and suddenly you have another one of your safeties on the field to stop the run, but they can also kind of flex, take on a tight end, take on a slot wide receiver. That's a big adjustment that Brian Williams can do and it also can help them out in the pass rush the blitz game trying to bring pressure from different places if you're not able to lock in on oh that guy's just a cover corner suddenly you become a lot harder team to scout a lot harder team to prepare for and then ultimately a harder team to play against and beat yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, like, like you said, you know, just the, the ability to kind of have um, so many of these guys where especially these, a lot of these guys or if they didn't return, a lot of these guys got here in January. So there's, they have about, you know, seven, eight months of kind of familiarity uh, within the scheme, what's expected. And obviously Zach Spavital, um was the, the lone uh, new addition on the defensive side of the ball. So a um, lot less familiarity there, or excuse me, a lot less uh, um, transition uh, on the defensive side of the ball there. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this this, this uh, secondary should be in good hands. I think obviously the focus is going to be able to generate turnovers, which they've been able to do during fall camp a little bit, especially early on, uh, taking, taking advantage of the offense in the red zone. So uh, I think that's going to be the, the biggest item on the to-do list, uh, create the big plays on defense. And I think, we saw a little bit of it last year, but I think maybe doing so a little bit more consistency, just given the returning talent, uh, I think that'll be the undoubted top focus. Yeah, and when you look at the schedule too, it's a lot of opportunities against a lot of unproven quarterbacks, especially early in the year. And that, that can be a blessing and a curse for them as, as the season kind of progresses. But they're definitely going to get those chances to jump on opportunities throughout the year against either first-year starters or teams that are just don't really have a certain quarterback. And I think that can really help them again play more aggressive, which is something that I know a lot of the fans have wanted to see. And I think that Loxley's kind of found is they're going to have to make plays. They're going to have to get turnovers. They're going to have to force teams to, you know, kind of be a little bit afraid or play a little bit more inside of what you want them to do. But when you're playing defense, you have to force them to do that. You have to take away what a team's strength is. And I think that this unit, especially with the coaching staff, something that I even forgot to mention until you brought it up, they've had a lot of turnover year over year. This year, they return almost all of that staff. You would hope that this kind of becomes the jump year for the defense. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that this, the defense, I, you know, I think they staff wise, chemistry wise, uh, uh, and players, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of confidence and just kind of what Maryland brings back on defense. And I think obviously last year, you know, fans were, they, you know, big, big uh, feather in the cap was, you know, Maryland's 
first to second half progression uh, under Brian Williams. So I think just, you know, having him back under that second year, just the overall familiarity on that side of the ball, I think just really is, um, is really why Maryland's defense should be at least in the top half uh, of the Big Ten. Yeah, and, and one of the big parts of that is the linebacking core of this team where you almost see year over year no turnover in your top four, especially on that inside linebacker p- position. And that when you talk about defense as strength, the linebackers become always the topic of discussion. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, uh, you know, I think you can make the argument that especially the inside linebacker room uh, is probably the deepest room on the team. I think wide receiver would probably be the the only position where I'd say, you know, you know, they're they're probably just as deep. Uh, but you know, I just think with Jason Barham, Ruben Hippolyte, Najee Gote, Caleb Wheatland, Jeremy Spragans, um, Michael Harris, you know, he's another guy. He got here in June and uh, he's looked real good. Um, so I think that there's a there's a lot of experience, and that's why I think you know Jay Sean Barham, where he has that explosiveness uh, and that instinctiveness. That's why I think you know he's able to you know be a little versatile a little bit more, and like he was last year, where he lined up a little bit outside. I think he he has that ability, um, uh, that that positional versatility uh, for Maryland this year. So I think you know obviously just having and a lot of these guys, you know, I think Deshaun Jones. A lot of fans looked at him and said, you know, hey, he's coming back for his sixth year. But now as he is also coming back for his sixth year. And, you know, he, he's been here, um, watched the entire Loxie culture kind of progress and whatnot. And he's not the most, you know, outspoken, you know, maybe natural leader, but the guy that he's very well respected uh, within the locker room. So I think he's another guy. And Ruben Hippolyte, um, he just leads by example. I think he's done so since he's enrolled so i think there's there's a lot of talent as well and then obviously caleb beatland you know i think we we saw him take that jump really when since he enrolled uh with that program uh with the program last uh june last january excuse me um so i think you know there, there's just a lot of quality pieces here um where you know a lot of quality depth as well yeah and i think the the big focus guys are going to be that second group right now or what it looks like that second group whether it is caleb wheaton and finanje gote out there is Again, consistently staying, staying on the field, being one, especially for Gote, he's had some injury concerns over time here for Maryland. I think for Wheatland, it's just that second year of football here at Maryland. You know, he came in, he was an early enrollee, and I believe he was also a little bit on the younger side. I think he was 17 when he enrolled uh, yeah. at Maryland. So, you know, he kind of gets into that spot where he's more, you know, caught up just across the board. And look, you're looking at a group where, I think they have a shot to really fly under the radar in the conference. You've seen all of those. I'm sure plenty of you guys have seen all of them. Uh, the top five lists from all like the BTN, you know, position group experts. And you're not seeing a lot of Maryland players on there in spots where I think are not a lot of Maryland position groups either in spots where I think they might belong. And this linebacking core is one that was brought up, you know, when BTN was at Maryland, they talked about it a little bit. I think every Maryland expert has talked about it and you just see, you know, it's always been that position of concern who they need like a fourth linebacker this year. They need to bring in, you know, they, they have two good linebackers, but you really need like four to five to almost six to really be successful in that. And they just don't have it. They only have a top two. This is the spot again, where you see recruiting start to happen now years into a program. You see a couple of guys who kind of have, you know, fallen a little bit down the depth chart, but now they're back up on it. And then you just have, again, experienced players like a Spragans, a guy who, you know, a lot of fans, don't really have always seemed to call out, but he came in from Juco. He's been with this program now for a couple of years. And if they need to put him in, in spots or where he can succeed, then they have the ability to do that. He doesn't need to be an every down linebacker for you. I think those things again are key. It allows them to game plan. It allows them to have guys take snaps off and it allows them to really spread their talent across the board and become overall a successful unit. Instead of saying, man, that, you know, Jay Sean Barham has got to play every play this week. I don't really think you're going to need to see that. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I think obviously, you know, the, the, especially the inside linebacker room, you know, quarterback of the defense. Uh, I just think that, uh, you know, that this room is proven. You know, there's no questions really about it, whether it's talent, whether it's depth. Uh, and I think that really helps. And like you said, you know, uh, I think even when you look at Loxie's first year in the linebacker room, uh, till now, obviously, you know, beginning, they were able to uh, kind of capitalize on the portal, you know, get Kendry Jones, get Jack Smith, but the depth just wasn't exactly there yet. So I think, you know, obviously, you know, we haven't talked about, you know, obviously I know he's a, he's an outside guy, but we didn't talk about really much about, you know, Avery, Dylan Gooden, but those guys were uh, four-star prospects out of high school. And I think those guys, I think Avery will probably get a chance to, to kind of flash a little bit as, a, as that Jack linebacker uh, behind Danelle Brown as well. Uh, but, you know, Dylan Gooden, I think he's a, another guy where he has that pass rush ability, outside backer. I think he fits best as a Sam. But just, you know, yeah, yeah, like, like we said, you know, just there's a lot of quality there 
it in that too deep. So I think this linebacker room, um, for whether it's the talent or the coaching, I think both Lance Thompson, James Thomas, both those guys have done a really good job um, just developing the, the talent there. So uh, the, the linebacker room is is going to be uh, probably I, I expect it to be one of the best in the Big Ten. Yeah, and, and that kind of takes us to what leaves you the most confident about this defense. I feel like, you know, you have a conversation about Maryland football defense since they joined the Big Ten, at least if not going back further. This might be the most positive preview they've been able to do. Yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, because of the biggest question mark to me is going to is was the, the defensive line. Um, do they – have the proven depth and we don't know that they have the proven depth yet, but you know what on paper and you know, the, the returns from fall camp is that, yeah, they, they've been able to show that uh, they, they've been able to generate some push. Uh, they've been able to control the line of scrimmage a little bit. And obviously, you know, Maryland's offensive line has been a work in progress. So um, I think that, I think that what we've seen from Tommy A, from Tyze Johnson, from, you know, and, and Jordan Phillips, what's expected out of him. I think all three of those guys will be able to, you know, kind of make make that front seven serviceable. And Maryland will be able to, you know, win some battles. You know, it might not be uh, pretty against the Ohio State, the Penn State, the Michigans this year. And all three of those schools uh, return really good offensive lines going into the season. So uh, I just think that, you know, there's there's a reason why that with a lot of these guys coming back that they're kind of able to, you know, maybe quiet some of those concerns. Um, I just think with the the overall talent uh, in the secondary, a lot of these guys that are just proven leaders, a lot of these guys that have the experience, uh, you know, Tarkeep Still, Bo Braid, uh, Ruben Hippolyte. I mean, these are all guys that have played, you know, 15, 20 games, 25 games throughout their, their careers in college park already. So, um, you know, you look at what Brian Williams did last year, I just think kind of all of it together, just the, the whole package uh, is kind of why this defense really should be good. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that. And you know what? The, you said proven depth there, and I kind of see it as depth for depth's sake in some ways, is at least they have guys that you, you're you right, that played 10, 12, 15, 20, 25 games, both non-conference, conference, you know, on the road. They've gotten guys that have gotten – you know, all the way from not being on like a travel squad to being in the rotation. And when you look at the trajectory of a program, building a team over time, something that I think really starts to factor in this year under Mike Loxley for Maryland, you get, oh, I've seen that player before, you know, suddenly they're not playing nobody's. And if you pay attention, if you watch all the games, you'll see guys that, that you notice out there. And yeah, there's always going to be a mix of transfers and new additions. That's just the era of college sports that it is they have to add to the transfer portal to bolster the roster because they're losing guys off of the team that that might have been expected to step into that role this year but when you look at it for me it's it's the safety play of this team they have the inside linebackers they also have two guys who kind of quarterback your defense from the back end being Dante Trader and Bo Parade I don't really think this is a defense that you're going to see a lot of big plays come against um, I think they're really going to be able to cover the field left to right, and it's going to allow them to blitz. It's going to allow them to kind of take away some of their weaknesses by using their strengths, and that's something that's going to build a stronger team. And you're right. I'm not sure what's going to happen when they line up against Penn State or Michigan teams that are going to want to run the ball 50 times in a game against them and really play smash mouth old-style Big Ten football. But I think the question that every fan has to ask themselves, every almost every person on, involved with the program in any sort of way has to be, can they go through a season and beat every team that they are better than on paper? And one of the things that's always stopped them from doing that is silly mistakes, giving up big plays. You know, that Purdue game kind of haunts me from last year when it comes to that. It's just like they could have done it, but they just didn't. They just weren't sharp that day. They just didn't show up. They didn't have the depth. They were banged up. They were you know, missing one guy they really needed. When you look at this defense, yeah, they lose their big name guys. It's going to hurt, but they have experienced backups in a lot of those positions. They have the ability to rotate guys in those high hit positions and that hopefully will pay off. But again, Loxley always likes to rotate guys. So you're going to see a lot of players out there. Just feel yeah. like you need to manage that, manage the workload early in the season. So they're still there healthy at the end of the year when they have some of those bigger name opponents coming to college park. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I like your your more specific answer. I feel like now mine was a little bit more of a cop out when I realistically just said I like the whole defense. But uh, but uh, I think obviously, like you said, you know, I just think that the court, the secondary, 
um, you know, like we said, you know, the, the big generating the big plays is going to be the big thing. But, um, you know, another thing you know, is, you know, Jaquan Shepard, Danelle Brown, or excuse me, not Danelle Brown, uh, Jordan Phillips, Avante Williams, all three of those guys have been with the program since January. So, you know, they've been very accustomed to the scheme. They went through spring ball. Danelle Brown, uh, he got, you know, he, he enrolled or joined the team for workouts and whatnot and uh, in June. So, you know, he, he's going to be another key piece, like we said. But uh, I just think, you know, just kind of the, maybe the experience with the linebacker room, obviously, like we talked about with Ruben, with Jay Sean, Fanage, Caleb Wheatland. I think all these guys, their play speaks for themselves, the way they carry themselves uh, in the locker room, the, the, the leadership that they kind of had, uh, that especially Ruben, uh, that kind of helps um, uh, maybe – leak out onto the rest of the, the defense, you know, maybe to, to kind of be that leader. Um, I think that's kind of what leaves me the most confident. Uh, I just think that they, they have the depth uh, to get through the Big Ten play, uh, even if you have to, you know, God forbid you lose, you know, Jay Sean Barham, Ruben Hippolyte, you know, you have to lean on Panaji Gote, Kayla Wheatland. Um, you know, those are those are two guys that you know, they, they can do it. Uh, I think they've been able to prove it in the past. I think Caleb Wheatland showed those flashes. So I just think that there's a lot to like uh, in the linebacker room. Kellen White's another guy. I, I just think that uh, with, with the returning talent, uh, with the way that they've kind of shown themselves over the last year, and I think was, uh, as Maryland looks to take advantage in the front seven uh, through conference play, I think uh, that that linebacker room is really going to shine bright this season. Yeah, and I think that's kind of a holistic look at the defense. Two other things I want to hit on. Who's going to be the impact freshman? It seems like Loxley always has a guy that kind of jumps up the list right before the season starts, and it at least you know makes an impact throughout the year. Not a ton of room, not a huge hole where they're looking to like fill it with a freshman this year, but who who do you kind of have as that impact guy? I'll I'll go with uh, with Dylan Pontes. I think he's a guy that you know maybe through through the season we start to see a little bit more. We talked about you know uh, I think even Loxy he mentioned uh, Merrill Media Day. You know he's going to have to kind of maybe accelerate the maturation process a little bit more. Um, and I think like, like I talked about when I hit on him with defensive line, you know he's a guy that they really liked out of high school. Um, the way that you know he's kind of able that six four, um, he's able to, to been, been able to put on about twenty pounds of muscle. Um, and I think now it's just kind of been you know getting accustomed to the college spe- speed of things. Um, so I think he's a guy where he's going to be able to you know find his way on the field especially uh in the short yardage situation so uh i'll, I'll go him i probably wouldn't be, go with mike harris uh i just think like like i said i think that linebacker room is going to be really good so i think uh mike harris could could pay, possibly be me be that uh that luxury yeah i have to go neo avery on on this one i just think it's because he may just get the most snaps out of every of any freshman on there i mean i would Clearly, if it was last year, the year before, I would have been saying it's Mike Harris just because they need another guy in that room. But I'll have to kind of tag off what you said and just say it's such a strong unit that hopefully he doesn't really need to take a ton of snaps, you know, unless he's really, really beating out guys. Yeah. Uh, I think just they're going to look to rotate that Jack linebacker position. That's that blitzing kind of maybe it's even blitzing Sam or Will, you know, where they can rotate guys throughout and bring pressure from different places. I think Neo's just going to have that opportunity. He's a long guy. He can come around the edge. And look, if if the pass rush is strong or if the linebackers are the concern, those outside backers, which has kind of been a weakness throughout Loxley's tenure here at Maryland, they're going to have that opportunity to really eat it up this year. And I think that he's going to be the guy that kind of jumps off, makes some flash plays this year. I don't really think he's going to be your every down guy, but certainly makes some splash plays. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very fair fair pick. You know, I think he's a guy. Obviously, when you know he enrolled in June, I think he's been able to. Um, you know, it's funny he was initially that that quarterback at good counsel, and everyone thought that oh, he did, he's not a quarterback at the next level. And you know what? Uh, if you ask him, he didn't want to play quarterback at the next level. He wanted to be you know that edge rusher, that that outside guy. And uh, I think once he made that move uh, to the defensive side of the ball, that was really when his recruitment really hit another level. Uh, out of high school, and I think he's kind of been able to do that ever since he came back from his ACL injury uh, midseason last year for Good Counsel. Um, he's been able to, you know, kind of work on that explosiveness and, you know, steadily chip away. So he's been good. He's been able to flash a little bit more. Uh, I think, you know, like you said, you know, Denell Brown, Kellen Wyatt, all those guys, you know, Dylan Gooden has that pass rush potential. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, Neo Avery, that blue chip uh, from last year's class, I think that's a uh, very, very solid pick for a uh, breakout player next year. So really quick, let's just hit on special teams. We're not going to have a chance to really preview them before we're into game week. So what are the Terps looking like? Obviously, kicker, the big hole that that everyone's looking to fill right now. 
Yeah, I think, you know, ever since Chad Ryland, you know, ever since he left, you know, uh, I, I posted on Inside the Black and Gold, uh, Jack Howells is going to be that guy. Um, I think he was going to be that guy last year, and it sounded like there was really comfort unless there was, you know, a true difference maker in the portal. And enter Chad Ryland, who was probably the best specialist in the portal last year. Um, and Loxie talked about about it, you know, just maybe being able to learn from Chad Ryland last year, uh, the way he approaches the game, his, his – um, just the, the preparation and whatnot uh, kind of helped him. So I think he's been able to kind of capitalize through spring ball. Um, they brought in a couple other kickers. I believe another uh, was a walk on from Eastern Michigan and, you know, how to beat him out. So I think I expect him to, to be the guy there, not exactly, you know, Chad, R- Chad Ryland level talent, but uh, definitely no slouch by any means. And I think the kicking game would be good. Uh, and the punting game, uh, Colton Spangler is back. Uh, obviously, him and uh, Anthony Barcarella were the two punters last year. Spangler was the uh, dominant one who took the uh, vast majority of the punts. Uh, so he's back uh, leading that. Uh, I expect Tarheep still to kind of be that main guy, Deshaun Jones, you know, but those guys have the experience. And I think just having two veterans is kind of what, what maybe helps them kind of hold on to that spot. Uh, and then the, in the kick return game, uh, I like uh, Ty Felton, Octavian Smith, Roman Hemby, Brandon Wozlowski, and then wouldn't be surprised if maybe Ryan Manning is another flex guy. So we shall see. Yeah, we certainly will. I think Octavian Smith just has that big boom player capability that, that everyone's looking for, at least in, in the recent Maryland fan, I guess, history. You had guys like Stefan Diggs returning kicks, Will Likely, that were always that threat to yeah. break it. We just haven't really seen that out of the return game since and i th- i really think that octavian smith's that guy i wouldn't yeah. be surprised by the end of the season if we see him on both i know loxley is more conservative on in the punt game jay sean jones really isn't going to break one for you i don't really think tarif still other than that i guess he had that punt return touchdown against virginia tech but they're not really guys who are you know your fastest or, or most they're looking to catch the ball a lot of fair catches from maryland's what we've seen in loxley's time but i think octavian smith i wouldn't be surprised if he cuts out that role of just bringing back that explosion to the return game. Yeah, I think so too. Obviously, I mean, Javon Leak was the guy. He was able to really uh, make that, yeah. that third phase of the game a uh, real asset for Maryland. I think, you know, Octavian Smith, I mean, last year, I think, what, midway through through conference play, I think Octavian Smith led the Big Ten in uh, return yards per game. So, uh, yeah, definitely wouldn't shock me. I, I I think a bold bold take would maybe say Octavian Smith has two plus touchdowns on special teams this year, and uh, I personally I can't wait uh, just getting to really cover him uh, through this last year and out of high school and whatnot. I think the more Maryland fans see him and just get get a chance to uh, learn, see his personality, I think the the more they'll love him. So uh, definitely definitely excited to to see him uh, grow this year. So we have game week coverage coming up this week. Um, our goal for the season is after Tuesday when Maryland has their media availability. We're going to do the pod. We're going to have a midweek pod kind of previewing the games. Not going to really be a true preview this week with Towson coming in. We're going to talk kind of season expectations, last pieces of camp. Terps will have their first depth chart out, uh, even though that's been notoriously unreliable. Um, But, you know, it will give you at least an idea. There's a lot of pieces, I think, where that three deep is a bit of a tell of who's kind of climbing the ladder. Not that it's going to tell you who's actually going to be in the game, but it will tell you who they're kind of liking as a staff right now. Then – we got some cool stuff coming post game uh, this year. We're gonna have a post game pod every week. It's just gonna be a matter of if we're gonna try maybe mix in some lives after the game to get that content out as quickly as possible. Get those instant reactions going, and then as the year progresses, we'll tweak, add things to it. If you feel like we're missing something here on the pod, drop us a comment. We're always looking for feedback on what we do here. Ahmed, anything yeah. to add? No, definitely looking forward to it. Season is. Uh... Definitely here. I think fans are, are, are ready for the end of preseason coverage and ready to get get rolling. So uh, excited to uh, excited to fire away. As always, subscribe for great Terps coverage inside the black and gold. That's where Ahmed has all of his insider content where he doesn't share with us here on the podcast. Um, and like this, r- rate it, review it wherever you listen to this podcast. Drop us a follow. Give us a like. It really helps us out here. And as always, thanks for watching.